Thank you, Daisy and Philip, for playing that piece for us. It is good to hear God's people use their God-given gifts to give God glory. And so thank you to you two and to the rest of the music team for leading us this morning in worship. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 24. Luke, chapter 24. I guess I should have mentioned, kids, you're dismissed, although I think they figured that out on their own. I guess the slide went up. That's what gave it away, right? Parents were like, where's that slide? (laughs) It better pop up soon. Luke, chapter 24. We are going to read the first 12 verses of Luke, chapter 24. This is what God's word says to us today from Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened, And bowed their faces to the ground. The men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now, it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles, but these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Let's just bow our heads for a moment and go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we've given you much thanks this morning. We've given you much praise and adoration for the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now we ask as we come to your word, the word that describes to us what happened that first Sunday morning, we ask that you would give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that would understand and obey what your word has to say. We thank you for the children that are downstairs. We ask that you would open up their hearts as well. Be with their teachers. Give their teachers words to say. Give them words of wisdom from your word to describe and make your word come alive in such an engaging way that that the hearts downstairs would be changed and impacted because of your word and that the little hearts that are there would come to know you in saving faith. We thank you that you are a saving God, a redeeming God, and we thank you that you've called us to yourself, and we ask now for your help as we consider your word, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the single most significant, single most important event in all of human history. That may sound like an overstatement or an over-exaggeration, but let me assure you that it's not. We cannot afford to get the resurrection wrong. We cannot afford to have the wrong idea and the wrong perspective on the resurrection. If the resurrection is true, if it is true that Jesus died and rose again three days later, then that necessitates, that means that we are obligated to listen to him. It verifies that all that he said and did while he lived and worked and ministered in Galilee for roughly three years, it validates all of his ministry. It proves it true. And it proves true what he said, that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. And by implication, if he has all authority in heaven and on earth, that means you are under his authority and must listen to him. Jesus says that his death and resurrection makes a way for sins to be forgiven that redemption has now been accomplished, that forgiveness is freely given to those that come to him. Jesus says that his death and resurrection is the only way for one to escape 
the only way for us to escape the judgment of hell, that we must put our faith in what he did. We must repent of our sin, seeing Jesus as the one to take our sin upon himself and put our faith, put our trust in him. Jesus says that in him we have new life, eternal life, that it is given to those, granted to those that come to him in repentance and faith. He says that believers have a hope themselves of one day being resurrected, of having new bodies, resurrected bodies, being changed and transformed, not just spiritually, but physically one day as well. But if the resurrection isn't true, if Jesus did not rise, if the statement he has risen is a lie, that means there is no forgiveness. That means there is no hope, there is no redemption. It means that the Bible is not true and as Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we are of all people most to be pitied because we have put our faith, we have put our hope in something that is hopeless. We have put our confidence in the wrong person. If it's not true, it means that Jesus was a liar and we're not obligated to listen to him, to follow him, to obey him. We are free to think and do as we want. We can live however we desire. Many choose to deny the reality of the resurrection. They prefer to live without the obligations that come with the fact that Jesus was once dead in the grave and now he stands gloriously, victoriously ruling and reigning at the right hand of the Father. The people would rather live without the implications of what that means. People list all sorts of excuses, don't they? That Jesus wasn't really dead that he had only fainted, that he only looked really dead, or they put forward this idea that perhaps there was this mass hallucination that took place with the disciples and the women and the roughly 500 that saw Jesus at one time. It was this mass psychosis that took place. Jesus wasn't really there, they just thought he was there. Some say that there's no way Jesus could come back to life because people just don't come back from the dead. That's not normal, that, that just doesn't happen. And we actually, as believers, we agree with people on that point, do we? That people don't normally come back from the dead? And that's why we take our stand with the one who actually came back from the dead. If somebody comes back from the dead, we ought to listen to him. We orient everything. We stake everything on the resurrection as Christians. We don't just orient our our week or our Sundays. That's why we gather on the first day of the week on Sunday because that was the day that the church recognized Christ rose from the dead. But we don't just organize our Sundays around the resurrection. We don't just organize our weekends around the resurrection. We organize our whole lives around the resurrection. Everything about who we are is dependent on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We need to have confidence in the reality of the resurrection because confidence in our hearts breeds hope. Hope for the promises that the resurrection secured that come through the resurrection of Jesus. But what does our confidence rest in? Where does our hope find its resting place? Do we look to the historical accounts outside of the Bible to the Jewish and Roman historians that wrote extensively about what happened roughly around 30 AD, 33 AD, wherever you wanna find that number? Do we gain confidence in the resurrection by ignoring what the skeptics have to say, by burying our heads in the sand, by kinda plugging our ears and going la 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 la, I can't hear you, is that how we grow our confidence and grow our hope in the resurrection? When it comes to the resurrection, what is What is the the peg that we hang our hat of confidence on? What is the coat hanger of, of hope that we hang everything on? Our passage this morning shows us the answer. These verses tell us exactly where we should put our hope. It tells us exactly where we should be looking if we want our confidence in the resurrection to grow. And in this passage we see three things, three influences, three things that impact the confidence of the disciples. The first two are are damaging influences, harmful influences that come upon the disciples. And the final one that we will see is the one that actually produces the confidence in the hearts of those that believe. The primary focus we will see is actually on the women that go to the tomb, but these influences, these impacts are true of all of the disciples, even those that stayed at home that first Sunday morning. 
Let me give you these three influences we see in this text. They are death, despair, and declaration. Those are the three influences, the three things that impact the faith and the hope of the disciples. The first one is that their hope was shaken by death. That's the first influence. Death comes in and it, it shakes, it disturbs, it unsettles their hope and their confidence in God, in the future. They were unsettled by the death of their rabbi and friend, Jesus of Nazareth. Their hope was shaken by death. They had thought that Jesus was the Messiah, the anointed one, the king of God who, had, who was coming to restore the people of God. Down in verse 21, we didn't read this, but down in verse 21, Cleopas says, we had hoped that he, that is Jesus, was the one to come and redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was the one to restore, to rescue, to save, but now he's dead. Jesus had been killed just a few days earlier. He had been falsely accused by the Jewish authorities who had convinced the crowd to call for his execution. He was mocked, spit on, beaten, whipped, scourged, flogged, gouged, stabbed. His flesh was torn away and finally when his body was broken so that he was unable to to even carry the cross beam that would become his cross, he was so weak that he couldn't even do that. He was finally taken outside of the city and three nails were driven into his body, two in his hands and one in his feet. The agony he endured lasted for hours until he finally breathed his last and gave up his spirit. Jesus was then taken down off of the cross and he was laid in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. To add sorrow upon sorrow to the disciples and in their hearts, they weren't even able to give Jesus the appropriate burial. They weren't able to to walk through the burial process because they were interrupted by the Sabbath. The Sabbath was was too close and they they had to stop working. They had to stop doing everything with Jesus. They basically had to, this sounds irreverent, but they had to dump his body in the tomb and go home because Sabbath was upon them. They had to wait until the Sabbath was over and they wait and now they go early at dawn and they bring spices so that they might finish burying their friend. They go because Jesus has truly died. Because he is really dead. There's no doubt in their minds. There's no doubt in anybody's mind. Jesus is dead. The swoon theory is false. This idea that Jesus had fainted, it's just not true. The Romans knew how to kill people. They were experts in execution. They came up with ways of torturing and killing people. And they wouldn't be fooled by a fainting spell. They pierced Jesus' side. And blood and water flowed from it. They stabbed his heart. And nobody can survive a spear wound to the heart. Jesus was dead. Truly dead. And it's the reality of death that brings the women to the tomb that morning to finish the burial process. They go to finish the process because he's dead. It's the reality of death that keeps the other disciples at home. The women go to finish the burial process, but the other disciples, the 11 that are left plus the many others that are there, they're dejected. All hope is lost, they think it's all over. They think the past three years of ministry with Jesus has now come to an end, we're done. We're finished. Their hope has been shaken by death. How often is our hope, our confidence shaken because of death? Because of the death of a loved one, family or friends? How often do we lose hope when we look around at all of the death and decay in the world and just we, we just feel that that whatever hope we had, whatever confidence and joy we had in life, it's just slowly being sucked away. A few weeks ago, I'm sure many of you saw it on the news, six people were killed in Nashville, Tennessee. A shooter targeted a, a Christian school, 
killing three teachers and three nine-year-old students. We see that kind of wickedness, that kind of, that, that display of depravity. We see the corruption and evil that would leave, lead someone to, to kill with such hostility and hatred and, and we're shaken. We're disturbed, we're unsettled by the reality of sin that leads to death. The disciples and the women, they have their confidence shaken, dashed to pieces really, just utterly destroyed. All of their hopes and expectations, all of their joys and delights have now been destroyed by the reality of death. Death was, was like an earthquake that came and, and just shook the very foundation of their faith and it crumbled what was once a living house of confidence, it crumbled it into despair and hopelessness. The disciples were once filled with hope, but now they're filled with gloom. They were once filled with delight and joy, but now they're filled with discouragement. The reality of death has shaken them to the point of despair, which leads us to the second influence, the second impact on their their hope, their confidence and it's that their hope was, was shaped by despair. It was shaken by death, and it led to despair. And despair then became the mold, the, the cast that their confidence, their hope was formed in, and as a result, it, it distorted their expectations. Their hope was shaped by despair. What were the women expecting that first Easter morning? What were they anticipating as they got up at early dawn and took the spices to the tomb? What were they expecting? They were expecting Christ to still be dead. They were expecting him to still be in the grave, in the tomb. They weren't expecting the the stone to be rolled away as it says in verse two. Tombs were sealed with very large stones that were set in a a channel, a a groove or a rut in the ground that basically kept them in place. It rolled in and it sat there and it stayed there. These stones were very big and very difficult to move, which is why they weren't expecting it to be moved out of the way. Mark's gospel actually tells us that, that the women were conversing on the way. They were talking on the way. How are we gonna get this stone out of the way so that we can finish the burial process? But when they arrive, they find that the stone is already rolled away. Do you know why the the stone was rolled away that first Easter morning? Do you know why God sent angels to move that very large stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Let me tell you that it wasn't because Jesus had to be let out. It wasn't as if Jesus had risen from the dead and he was stuck on the inside of that tomb kind of knocking on the stone from the inside saying, Father, you need to send some angels to let me out or I'm gonna be stuck in here. John's gospel tells us that Jesus, after his resurrection, appeared to disciples inside of a locked room with the door closed. He appeared. The door, the lock, they didn't keep Jesus out. And this stone that was in front of the tomb, it wasn't going to keep Jesus in. No, the stone was rolled away to let the women in so that they might see, so that they might have have visual confirmation that the tomb was empty because they weren't expecting the tomb to be empty. They were expecting the body of Jesus to still be lying there. They weren't expecting the, the linen cloth that we're told about in verse 12 that Peter sees They weren't expecting it. John's gospel tells us that it was neatly folded up and put in its place all on its own. They weren't expecting that, but they needed to see it. They were still expecting Jesus to be dead, and the evidence that they saw, this stone that was rolled away, the tomb that had no body, and the linen cloth that had no body wrapped around it, or wrapped in it, it left them perplexed, we're told in verse four. It left them wondering, it left them confused, it left them without understanding. Despair over the reality of death had left them without that understanding, had left them shaped by their despair. So God in his infinite mercy and kindness, he sends messengers, he sends angels to explain it to them. These angels, these men were told in Luke's gospel are later confirmed in the other gospel accounts as angels and all we have to do is look at 
the description of them here and we see that they're described as angels are. They appear out of nowhere and that would have been startling enough but Luke also mentions their shocking attire. Verse four says they were dressed in dazzling apparel. Their clothes are, are flashing. Their garments are, are gleaming. They are, they are white, they are bright just like lightning flashes and gleams across the night sky during a storm. You've all seen that before I'm sure. That's what their clothing was like. What does this mean? It means that these two men, these two angels have come from the very presence of God. They come with the important task of declaring the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But before they declare the good news, before they get to the he is risen part, what do they do? They rebuke the women. They rebuke them for allowing the reality of death and the resulting despair in their hearts to shape their expectations of what was going to happen that Sunday morning. Why do you seek the living among the dead, they say in verse five. Why are you here? What are you doing? Why are you expecting Jesus to still be in the tomb? You're anticipating death here in the grave, but you ought to be anticipating life. He is not here, which at this point, the women would have figured that out. The women recognize Jesus isn't there, that he's not in the tomb anymore. The question is why? Why is he not there? Did they go to the wrong tomb? Did they make a left when they should have made a right? Did they just get confused amidst, amongst the, the tombstones? Did someone come and, and steal the body, take it away? Did grave robbers come and, and steal the opportunity to give Jesus a proper burial? No. Why is the tomb empty? Why is there no body? Why is Jesus not there? The angels say, because he has risen from the dead. This is the answer they could not deduce. This is the answer they, that they couldn't figure out. They see all of the evidence, but they don't know what it means. This was the truth that they had difficulty discerning. The clues on their own didn't help. They didn't result in understanding automatically. The evidence didn't produce assurance in the hearts of the women that Jesus was risen. Which is why the angels point to something else as proof. They direct the women, after rebuking them, to consider something other than the visible evidence in front of them. The angels have come to strengthen the confidence of the women. They want the women to be assured of the reality of the resurrection. And this leads us to our third and, and final influence, the final impact that, that helps build and strengthen their confidence. Their hope was, was secured by declaration. It was secured, it was built up, it was stabilized, it was made firm by words. Their confidence was fixed by what was said, by what was declared. Their hope was secured by declaration. But it wasn't the declaration of the angels that built their confidence. It wasn't the declaration of the angels that helped build their hope, that restored their hope to what it ought to be. The, the, the angels were just messengers. They were just the ones sent by God as, as the pointers, as kind of these giant supernatural laser pointers that say, hey women, look over here, disciples of Jesus Christ, look over here, look right here. And where do they tell the women to look? Where do the angels direct their attention towards so that they might understand what the empty tomb means? They don't direct their attention towards the, the stone that is rolled away. Consider this stone, how big it was, how large it was, how difficult it would have been to move. Do you not see the power of God as it has been moved away? They don't point at the, at the empty tomb itself. Don't you see there's no body here? They don't point to the linen cloth. What do the angels do? The angels tell the women to remember. Remember what Jesus told you. Remember what he said. They are told to remember because they had forgotten. They had let the words of Christ slip from their minds. Their grief had caused them to forget the words of the living and incarnate Son of God. Grief makes it hard to remember, doesn't it? It's hard to remember the words of God when, as the hymnist says, when sorrows like sea billows roll over us again and again and again. It is hard to remember what God has said, but it is in those moments of turmoil and distress we must be reminded of what's found in God's word. 
we must be reminded like the women at the tomb that day to remember what he has said to us. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Do you remember that he predicted that this would happen? Do you remember that he said that it was going to happen this way? The events of Good Friday did not come as a surprise to God. It was not an accident. They were not unexpected. Jesus wasn't caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. This was the plan all along. Verse seven says that the Son of Man must be delivered. Jesus said that he had to walk this path. This was the purpose, this was the point. This wasn't plan B, this wasn't an afterthought. This was God's plan from the beginning. When Peter would preach to the crowds at Pentecost in Acts chapter two, he has thousands of people standing in front of him and he is proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ and he's saying, we have seen with our own eyes, we have heard with our ears, we are witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And as he's describing what happened, he says that it all happened according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. This was expected. This is what we should have anticipated. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, it was foretold, it was prophesied, it was promised, and not just by Jesus. The promise of the sacrificial lamb stretches all the way back to the very beginning of time itself, from before the foundation of the earth, we're told. And the women and the other disciples that are at home dejected and filled with despair, they should have grounded their expectations of Sunday morning in what God had said, in what he had revealed to them in his word. That's what the angels point to as proof. That's their main source of evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. There was other evidence. The stone was rolled away, the tomb was empty, the linen cloth was, was still there with no body, then there would be more evidence. There would be more things that people could point to as proof for the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus himself would appear to many. He would appear to Mary Magdalene outside of the, the tomb later that morning. He would appear to the disciples inside that locked room. He would appear to Thomas, the one who doubted and said, no, not until I can touch his hands, not until I can touch his sides will I believe. He appeared to more than 500 at one time. He appeared to many to prove to them, to show to them that the resurrection really did happen. There's lots of external evidence. There's lots of external things that we could point to. There's lots of visual and even medical evidence as we, those who are experts in medicine, can look at what happened here and can go, yeah, Jesus was really dead. And yes, Jesus is really alive. There are lots of other evidences that build our confidence in the reality of the resurrection. But that is not where the women are told to look. They are exhorted to fix their eyes on, to remember, and by implication, to believe the words of Christ. Why do the disciples, later in verses 11 and 12, why do they think their, their story sounds like an idle tale? Why do they think that the women describing what happened at the tomb, why do they think that, that this just sounds like a fairy tale? This just sounds like something they're making up. This doesn't sound real. It's not because the women were known to be liars. It's not because they were known to be gossips or known to be people that just made things up. It's not because they were unreliable sources of truth. It's not because the disciples didn't want it to be true. It's not as if the disciples were sitting there in that room, in that house, wherever they were, and they were sitting there going, good, I'm glad Jesus is gone, and that's why they didn't believe. They wanted it to be true. They wanted all of it to be true, that Jesus wasn't dead. They don't think these women are telling idle tales because the grave wasn't really empty. Peter himself will get up and he will run to the, the tomb and he will see that it's empty. <coughs> Excuse me. Why do they not believe the women? They didn't believe the women because they didn't believe Jesus. They didn't believe what he had said. 
They weren't convinced by the women because they failed to remember and believe the words of Christ. What happened to the women when they remembered? We're told in verse eight, and they remembered his words. What, What happened after they remembered what Christ had said? Well, they were strengthened. They were encouraged. Their confidence was restored. Their hope was built up. They become assured of the reality of the resurrection before they even see the risen Christ. How do we know that they believed? How do we know that they responded with hope? Because they go and tell others in verse nine. They go and tell the disciples, the apostles, and all those that are with them. And you don't tell people something that makes you look and sound really, really crazy unless you believe it. Some people do want to lie, but these women weren't lying. They believed it. They are strengthened when they remember and believe the word of God. It was enough. It was enough for their belief, for their hope, and it's still enough today. The word of God is still sufficient for belief today. It is good to consider other pieces of evidence It's right to examine the accusations of the world and carefully come to meaningful answers for the skeptics. It is helpful to consider the external proofs of the resurrection, of which there are many. But it is far better to consider the proof of God's word. It is far better to examine what he has said and base our confidence, base our hope on his word. Why? Because seeing isn't believing. Jesus tells a, tells a parable, and in it, this rich man goes to hell, and this poor man, Lazarus, goes to heaven. And there's this whole conversation, I won't describe it all for you, you can read it later. But Ab- this, this, this rich man tells Abraham, send somebody back to warn my brothers. Send, some, send Lazarus back. Send Lazarus back from the dead so that they may see, so that they may hear from somebody who's come back from the dead. Surely they will listen to him. And Abraham says, no, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God. And if they will not believe the word of God, they will not believe even if someone should rise from the dead. The word of God is enough. Seeing isn't believing, and we don't need to see in order to believe. All we need is the word of the crucified Christ. He says that all who come to him in repentance and faith receive forgiveness of sins. That's what he says. That's what he declares. That's what our hope is built on. All we need is the promise of the risen one to give us confidence, to give us hope for the future, that one day we will spend an eternity in glory with him. We base it on his word, what he said to us. His word is sufficient. It is enough. It is the foundation of our hope that Jesus died and rose again. (coughs) We may never see the empty tomb. We may never have angels appear and tell us that it's true. Jesus may never appear to us in the flesh like he did to the disciples. We may never touch his hands. We may never touch his feet. We may never touch his side. We may never feel the wounds that the nails made. But we know that it is true. We have confidence that Jesus died and rose again because the almighty king of kings has said so. And that's enough. That's more than enough. The word of God is all that we need. Remember what he has said. That is all we need for our confidence, all we need to believe. So what about you? You have heard what he has said in his word. Will you cling to the evidence of his word? Will you believe what he has said? Because blessed are those that do not see and yet believe. Let's pray. We give you praise today. 
Dear Father in heaven, we give you thanks for sending your Son to die upon a wicked and cruel cross on behalf of poor wretched sinners. We thank you for the glorious hope of the gospel that all who look upon Christ with eyes of faith find forgiveness at the cross. We pray that you would you would open up our eyes to see and build our confidence in the resurrection based upon your word, based upon what you have said, based upon the declaration of Jesus Christ that he who is who was once dead and put in a tomb, now stands ruling and reigning on high. We thank you for our king. We thank you that he's a good king. And we ask that you would help us to follow him faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm gonna ask that you stand and we're gonna sing a closing hymn together. The chorus says, for me he died. For me he lives, in everlasting life and light he freely gives, and we cling to that hope because of his word. Let's sing. He is risen. risen Let's pray. Father, as we close our time of worship this morning, we pray that the joy and hope in our hearts that come from your word would continue on throughout our day. As we gather with family, as we go home and nap, as we do all of our normal, everyday things, Lord, we ask that you would remind us of the hope of the resurrection and help us to cling to the truthfulness of your word. Remind us that one day we shall see him face to face. We thank you for these promises, and we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor. 
In the name of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.